I'm recording. Let me say that again so that the recording can get me. Good evening, everybody. Um, hey, children. Hey. Hey, they, was, they worked a full-time job. <laughs> They work the full time job. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. It is time for our life class. My nerves. <laughs> it is time for our life class. I see it. People still coming in and connecting. I'm, I'm asking that if you are not the teachers tonight, if you can um, mute your phones, there won't be any interference in the teaching tonight. Um, we have. We're actually going to have two classes in one tonight. Are going to do our. Uh, we are going to be talking about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about Pentecost tonight. Um, as you all know, we're leading up to the Feast of Pentecost which comes in on Saturday at sunset, amen, into Sunday, um, which we would deem as Pentecost Sunday. Um, and if you don't know what Pentecost is, you will learn what Pentecost is tonight. So this is what we're going to do. Our Deacon Colette is going to go first. She's, go she's going to give us 30 minutes on Jesus and the Holy Spirit right after her youth pastor is going to take over amen and he's going to teach us about pentecost and then after that we will have a q a um if anyone has any questions um that they want to ask the teachers or even maybe <clears throat> maybe elaborate or add on to what's already um taking place so let's welcome deacon colette let me find her so that i can put her is that bishop limpscomb Oh, hey, brother. Bless you. So I'm going to, um, good to see you, sir. Hey. Um, I'm trying to, okay, I found her. I'm going to pin her so that you all can see her. Okay, now we got her. All right, so Dickie Colette is on here. Um, Y'all pray for her. She's nervous, amen, but she can do it. She can do it, all right? Whew. Let us pray before... Uh, um, they begin, Father, we thank you for this time and this gathering that you have given us, hallelujah, as a week of study and to dig into your word. God, as we experience the ministry of the teacher, we thank you and we praise you, God, that you'll bring all things back to remembrance. And God, you will illuminate our minds, that you will encourage our spirit and that you will, hallelujah, dig in us and dig out something that we never experienced before. We give you praise for the grace and the anointing, Father, in these teachers. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you will use them tonight to reveal and open up. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you. And most of all, we bless you for this Pentecost season that, you, that you're shifting us in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. All right. Hey, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Woo, uh, pray my stress. I am very, very nervous. Um, thank you, Apostle, for allowing me to, to uh, say what was given to me in regards to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Um, I have nothing to say. Colette has nothing to say to you guys. The Holy Ghost um, has something to say to you so um i'm just the vessel that's being used i'm allowing him to do what he do and um with that being said um let's let's just have a little little section a little chit chat um so um according to my my uh part that was given to me is jesus and the holy spirit according to the new testament and um, with that being said, of course, within the New Testament, um, it started out with Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. And um, once that act took place, that's when 
the Holy Ghost. Jesus was basically filled with the Holy Ghost, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. Um, the Holy Ghost um, came upon him in the form of a dove. And um, when that happened, the heaven opened up and his father, God, spoke and said, um, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So with that being said, and that action being done, basically, um, Jesus was able to start doing what he needed to do to basically fulfill his purpose. When that happened, he had to basically, we already know um, from other teachers and that have uh, come on before me, we all know that um, we have to basically get in a relationship. We have to have a covenant relationship with the Holy Ghost. We have to basically come into an agreement, into a relationship with him and allow him to do what he do best through us and with us. He's a gentleman. He's not going to fight us. He's not going to force himself on us. He's not going to make us do anything that we don't want to do. Because when, if that happens, it's not going to be the same, basically, fulfillment and the same outcome. Because it's like a child. You forcing a child to do something. It's going to be a little kickback. It's going to be some you know, some, some static there, and it's like, okay, it's going to get done, but what are they going to learn from it? What is it? What's going to be the outcome of it? Will they remember it? Will they remember it as a good thing? Will they remember it as a bad thing? Like, oh, mommy or daddy made me do that. I basically just had to do what I was told. So it's better when we co-labor with the Holy Ghost and allow him to work through us and do what we do what needs to get done so God can be glorified and his kingdom can grow. So, um, it's two types of baptism, one with water and one by the blood. Um, and with the blood, it's the word, it's a Greek word and it's spelled, it's, um, please uh, forgive me if I'm saying it wrong. It's called martyrdom, M-A-R-T-Y-R-D-O-M. That's M-A-R-T-Y-R-D-O-M. And the meaning for that word is death or suffering. A person who willingly suffers death rather than renounce his or her religion. A person who is put to death or endures great suffering on behalf of their belief, principle, or their cause. So Jesus had a purpose to fulfill. That was his cause. He had to basically, he had like, he had like an agenda, had an itinerary that he has to fulfill. Basically going, going out and performing, healing the sick you know, um, performing mer different miracles, you know, um, and with all of that being said and done, if he did not lean, if he did not depend, and if he did not allow the Holy Spirit that was now abiding in him to lead him and to direct him and to guide him on uh, making sure that these assignments were complete, it would not have been done. We have no power of our own, but the power that's given to us. And the power that's given to us is the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. There are seven spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit. And these are the endowments or the ability. The first one is wisdom. The second one is understanding. There's counsel. There's fortitude. There's knowledge. There's piety, P-I-E-T-Y. And there is the fear of the Lord. I'll say that one more time for everyone that's writing. The seven spiritual gifts, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, P-I-E-T-Y, and fear of the Lord. 
let's not confuse those or mislabel those thinking those are the fruit. Of course, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are all characteristics of the Holy Ghost, the personality. So basically, the, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you have to exemplify, you have to have these characteristics within you somewhere. If you have the true indwelling of the Holy Ghost, they have to be amongst you. Has to be amongst you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Holy Ghost will teach us how to bridle our tongue if we depend on him to do so. If we give him full control over us, he will do exactly what he needs to do. He will not allow us to operate out of character as long as we trust him enough to lead us and direct us and to guide us. We have to basically let our flesh die daily. It's a daily process. It's, it, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. And if Jesus did not allow him to have full control, none of the acts, none of the miracles, none of what he did would have taken place. There are six sins against the Holy Spirit. The first one is blasphemy. And that's deliberately rejecting Christ, rejecting his message and gift of salvation. When you deliberately do something, that means that you just don't care. You just be like, whatever. It is what it is. You, ha you don't care. You don't care what the outcome is. You just, it's like you're doing your own thing and you, you have no remorse about it. And that, you can find that according to Matthew 12 and 31. The second one is, Lying to or tempting the Holy Spirit. And you can find that in Acts 5, 4 through 9. And everybody know of the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And that's when they, they sold, they got the money and held in secret and in, in secretly withholding a part of the piece of land. You can't lie and, and think that it's okay when you really, really allowing the Holy Ghost to be the head of your life. There is a conviction that will come behind it. You just lying just to be lying. Something is wrong. You really, really need to check your Holy Ghost. If you could just blurt out a lie and have no remorse about it, you really, really need to check yourself. It's time to go back to the altar. It's really time. You really, really need to seek the faith of the Lord, get back in his faith. And that's Acts 5, 4 through 9. The I third one is, Despising the Holy Spirit. Exceeding rejection of Christ by verbally and actively. Actively means that it's something that's ongoing. It doesn't stop. Actively discounting Christ to others and ridiculing to all that his blood sacrifice counts us nothing. And that is, you will find that in Hebrews 10, 29. The fourth one is resisting or striving with the Holy Spirit. Choosing to resist the prompting. Prompting, he's telling, you can hear that little still voice in your head telling you, don't do that. Don't make that phone call. Don't act that way. Don't slap them. Don't put your hands on them. Don't curse, but you still choose to do it. Help me, Lord. 
you still choose to do it. You hear him telling you not to do it and you still choose to do it. You're deliberately being disobedient. The convicting of the Holy Spirit to convince you of your sinfulness. That's according to Genesis 6 and 3. You said conviction of the Holy Spirit? The convicting of the Holy Spirit to convince you of yourself, of your sinfulness. Got it. The fifth one is vexing. That's the island word. Vex. <laughs> I'm vexed. Vexing or grieving the Holy Spirit, making the Holy Spirit weary with you. When something becomes weird, it's like having a pair of shoes on and you keep on wearing them shoes everywhere you go, all day, every day. After a while, you're going to wear them out. They're not going to give you the support, the balance, the stability that you need to basically keep your body in line with your stride to make it easier for you to move around and walk. That's a good analogy. So you don't want to wear him out. After It's like your body. If you don't take care of your body, it's not going to take care of you. It's going to shut down on you. You cannot wear yourself out. So let's not vex the Holy Ghost or grieve him. And you can find that in Isaiah 7 and 13 and 63 and 10 and also Ephesians 4 and 30. And this one here hit home a little bit. Quenching the Holy Spirit. Mm. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm guilty of it. Very similar to resisting the Holy Spirit, but in the sense of hindering his prompting so as to suppress them. Mm. Don't quench him. He is there to help you and to guide you. If he's leading you to do something, trust him enough to let him lead you. If you allow him to lead you and direct you, you'll never go wrong. You will not lean to your own understanding. You will solely depend on him. Because if Jesus leaned to his understanding, honestly, what would he have accomplished on his own? You can find that in Thessalonians 5 and 19. First or second Thessalonians? Um, first. You said, give me the um, chapter in the verse again. Chapter 5, verse 19. Okay. In order for, in order for our lives to grow spiritually and also naturally, because there has, there has to be a balance, number one. Number two, you have to, you have to have someone guiding you that you can trust in the spirit realm. So if we don't turn ourselves over to him, and trust him to do what he needs to do within us, how far are we going to get and where are we going to go? We're basically going to limit our growth spiritually if we don't trust the Holy Ghost. If Jesus did not trust the Holy Ghost, he would not have made it to Calvary and died for us. <clears throat> he would not have made the journey. In his journey, it was many things that I'm sure him being human within the journey, it's many things that made him probably was saying, I can't do this. I'm not built for this. This is something that I'm not going to get done if, I, if the Holy Ghost don't lead me and guide me and direct me and give me the strength that I need. Because truth be told, 
if he wanted to, all he had to do was just talk to his father and ask his father to just be like, I'm done. And it would have been done. It would have been done. But because of the strength of the Holy Ghost, he was able to fulfill and accomplish <laughs> accomplish what he has set out to do. So I don't I don't I don't have too much and I'm not gonna go off and say something else that wasn't said to me and that wasn't in my spirit. All I'm gonna say to you guys is this. And even with um even with Apostle asking me to teach this class, I thought I was gonna get out of it. But of course not having a bishop like Apostle Thomas, you don't get out of an assignment. So with that being said, number one, we have to go back to our foundation. We have to go back to our foundation and our foundation is going back to the altar where it first started. And if you have to petition, you have to petition God to refill you all over again and start from scratch, start from scratch. Start over. It's never too late to start over. But what's the sorry thing to do is to continue that continue the way that you're going. You cannot continue the way that you're going. And with that being said, we have to we have to to be successful in this world, you have to relinquish. You have to relinquish your control. You have to. It's just, I said I, was, I wasn't going to do this because I was going to get bombed out, but it's something that has been on my script, that was given to me to do. So when I say go back to your foundation and basically starting over, I have to start over. Within this whole quarantine, you know, and not being able to work and everything of that sort and, you know, taking care of my hair like I want to, my hair broke off. And it broke up to the point where I was like, okay, the sides were good. It looked good from a distance. But if you got up close and started really looking at it and going through it, you can see where the damage and everything was. So what did I have to do? I had to start over. So I had to cut my hair off. It's not something that my apostle likes, but... I say all of that to say this. It's like a relationship. Sometimes you have to go back to the basics. That's good. Go back to the basics and start again. When you decide to go back to the basics and when you allow yourself to go back to the basics, it's not a bad thing. It's that you care enough about the relationship that you're trying to save. You care enough about that relationship that you're willing to give it a try starting from scratch. You wipe the surface completely clean. Wipe it clean and start all over. As long as your foundation is secure, you can always start on your foundation again. Your foundation is not going anywhere. That's good. So start over. Start trusting him again. Start over. Start over. It's never too late to start over. He gives us many chances to get it right. We'll never be perfect. All he asks us to do is try. Um, that's it. I hope I said something that blessed you guys. Um, you know, um, and that's all. Thank you all for listening. I um any questions before we move on? I wanna I wanna give clarity on one thing. Yes, sir. Any questions? Add ons. I know we got the great bishop on here. I have a question. We know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a question, but I want to make sure um, what I'm thinking is correct or incorrect. Um, and I try to make sure I remembered it when um, is it LD Let? No. 
No, oh. Deacon. Deacon. Don't, don't push me too far. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but you mentioned something um, about uh, the Holy Ghost won't allow us to do. He won't make us do. I think that's what you say. He won't make us do something. He won't make us do anything that we don't want to do. And I agree and then I kind of disagree. But then I also know what aspect you're coming from. Okay. But I want to make sure um, I want to make sure I understand the part you're, you're referring to. Because what I take took from that, like, in my own personal experience with the Holy Ghost, it's a lot of things that um, I've come into contact with a lot of people as well as myself. And it's a lot of times that we don't want to do something. And, like, for example, a calling on your life. You can run from the calling all you want to. But eventually, you're going to have to subject yourself to the will of God because that's what he has for you so you can't you can run or you, you can try to run you can try to hide but a lot of times i pray and i let god know i don't need you to put me on the back on my back or in the hospital for me for you to get my attention like I, it's times i ran and i know that i didn't want to do it but it didn't matter what i wanted if that's what god had for me i was going to do it so i just come to realize it doesn't matter what i don't want to do and it, it also doesn't matter what I do want to do. Because sometimes, for example, online, I'll, I'll be feeling some type of way and I'll be ready to go off. And I'm texting. I'm really about to post it. And the Holy Ghost literally, I'll be trying to ignore, it, ignore him so much, but he'll remind me, delete it, delete it. And I'll be so mad. I'm like, nope, I'm posting this. I don't care. And the Holy Ghost be like, delete it and i'm like okay let me go ahead because there's been times i miss my blessing because i was disobedient to his voice and i knew god was telling me to delete it but it's what i it's how i was feeling at that time so like what you said i kind of agree and i kind of disagree because it doesn't matter what you want to do when it comes to god you're going to either do it on your own or you're going to be forced and also he put us through a lot of tests. Is that always the case, though? Mm. Is that always the case? Is that always always the, case? case? The, the force? Yes, because we That's have freedom. We have That's free will. So is that always the case? Is it possible that you can just deliberately disobey him? Yes, you can mm. deliberately disobey oh, yes, him. It's a, okay. yes, it's, it's, a it's a choice. Yes, it's a choice. It's a choice. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna open up a can of worms too much because <laughs> uh -oh. I know, <laughs> you know I'll do that. But I want to hear youth pastor tonight too, so I'm not gonna open up a can of worms too much. But we all gonna get come back to that, Kavita. Okay. Can I, can I say something about that? Yes, that's, that's good that's, question. Um, though. Kavita, Kavita mentioned she um said something. She said that um she disagreed today, and um. I'm, well, I don't want to say that you can't disagree to that, but um, that's why you often hear that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He doesn't rush up on you. Um, everything, salvation is a choice, just like recovery is a choice. You have to make a choice to do it. So even if you are in the process, um, hence myself, of posting something, for example, the, the example that you used, um, you had to make a decision not to post it because you could have heard him tell you not to post it. And there's been times that you did post it. So mm -hmm. he does not force you. He doesn't force you. He gives you free will. Who that will? You have to have a right. will to do it. Right. That's all. Hey, you that girl. Up. You that good girl. Okay. I just wanted to bring clarity to one thing. Yes. Um, Deacon Colette, you mentioned um, that there were seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh-huh. Um, not correcting you, um, but that's helping fine if you, that's fine if you do. But helping you, there are twelve gifts of the Holy Spirit, and they are found in um, First Corinthians twelve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, what you were talking about are the seven spirits or ministries of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. that are found in Isaiah, the eleventh chapter, I believe, is verse two. Right, Bishop Lemscombe is verse two. All right. <laughs> 7th verse 13. Right. So it's 1 <laughs> Corinthians 12 are the gifts. 
I'll read it. I think it's verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. But to one is given the Spirit of, a, of the Spirit, the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So those are the gifts of the spirit. Now what she was talking, what she was talking about was the seven spirits of God, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, which are found in Isaiah, the 11th chapter, the second verse. So I just wanted to bring clarity to that. Thank you. You're welcome, Rev. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be Rev this time. <laughs> <laughs> I see you, Deke. All right, very good, Colette. Can we give uh, her a hand clap? <laughs> very good. All right. <laughs> We're moving into Pentecost. Let me switch pins really quickly. Grace and peace, to, um, YP, as they uh, say. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Um, so I have the topic of Pentecost. Um, I'm just going to go through a whole bunch of stuff that I study. So um, I'm first going to start off with explaining the Holy Spirit um, to give more of an understanding. I know everybody has given their uh, their side of the hope what the Holy Spirit is and the meaning. But <clears throat> mine start off with um, the majority of Christians... Um, denominations, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The true and God manifests as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, each entirety itself being God. The Holy Spirit is co-equal co with God the Father, God the Son, and is the same in his essence. Yet, he is distinct from them. Um, scripture describes the Holy Spirit in personal terms, not as an impersonal force, but it says he teaches guys, comforts, and intercedes. Um, go on to um, understanding the Holy Spirit in a whole. The Holy Spirit is in triunity with God and Jesus, having the same essence, which meaning the individual or the ultimate nature of a thing, especially as opposed to its existence, which means the Holy Spirit is God just in a different form. Um, this is why I believe that it's easier for us to accept the Holy Spirit because God created, created us in his image. Um, when I say in his image, I'm talking about in representation. Um, he gave us a look for us to be who we are and for him to put his spirit into us. So we were created to represent God in the way that he is pleased or what he thought to create. Um, now I'm going to go into... Some scripture, I want to start with John 14. Um, this part that um, I grabbed, uh, the scripture that I grabbed, is pretty much saying what the role of the, the Holy Spirit is. Um, starting from the 16th verse, and it says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, and standby. To be with you forever. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. I forgot to tell y'all that. What um, verse? It's starting from 16. John 14 starting at 16. And I'm, I'm reading from Amplified. I'm sorry. I forgot to tell y'all. Um, 17 says, The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive and take his heart because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he, the Holy Spirit, remains with you continually and will be in you. 18 says, I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless, bereaved, and helpless. I will come back to you. I'm going to jump down to 26, and it says, but the helper, um, but the helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strength, and standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, 
in my place to represent me and act on my behalf. He will teach you all things, and he will help you remember everything that I have told you. You have heard me tell you I am going away, and I'm coming back to you. If you really love me, you will have rejoiced, because I'm, I am back to the Father, and for the Father is greater than I. Um, this, this particular scripture where Jesus was talking to his disciples and letting them know that for them not to worry, um, not to worry because he's, the way that he left, he's going to return. So when Jesus ascended, that's the same way that the Holy Spirit came upon them. So during this time of Jesus' lifespan, there had to be an event, which was his crucifixion, to happen so the completion of God's plan had to be complete. God said, when I was praying, I asked God to give me a little bit more of what, what that first part was, what he gave me. And he said, the people knew me, but they couldn't see me. So I sent myself in human form. But then you, but then you crucified me, which was his son Jesus, for the things that you needed. So now I'm going to send myself as the Holy Spirit, and I will show myself in ways that you can see me and you will have access to feel me. Then now I'm going to go to Acts, the first chapter. Um, when I was starting to read about Pentecost, I wanted to go back. Um, I wanted to go back a chapter to get more of an understanding of what happened before um, they went into the upper room. So Acts 1, 13, it starts off saying, and when they entered, sorry, backtrack. Um, Acts started off, it's after, the, after Jesus' ascension, they, um, those who saw him go up um, were questioning and were confused of what was going on. But Jesus had already told them what was going to happen and what they needed to do. So after they saw the ascension and the men who were, who were there who appeared, told them, why are you worrying? In, my, in better words, paraphrasing, why are you worrying? The same person that you saw go up is coming back. So after they, after they left from there, they were on the Mount of Olives. And when they come back, came back into the city, which was Jerusalem, they mounted the stairs to the upper room where they were indefinitely staying. Um, it names the disciples, the 11 disciples, John, Peter, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, and Judas, son of James. So these 11 people added on with the women that they were with and Mary and Jesus' brothers went into the upper room first. They went to the upper room first to create an atmosphere for whatever God was going to do or whatever Jesus said that God was going to do, what he was going to send the comforter. So the upper room, when I looked up the upper room, I wanted to get more, un more of an understanding because we know about the upper room and what happened there. And it says, the upper room was design designed for prayer, meetings, and a space for healing. So when they returned from the Mount Olive, the upper room was where they ended up. And when they ended there, they had to do the same thing Jesus did because in the upper room is where they had the Last Supper. And Jesus prepared the room for them to eat and to feast so now they had to do the same thing Jesus did to prepare the same room for the coming of the Holy Spirit so when the disciples and Jesus and the other people that they were with when they were in the room they created that space so they prayed got the atmosphere prepared for the days that was coming but the only difference between the room that Jesus did where he prepared the room and furnished it, instead of it being furnished, it was empty. So they had more room to fit people in for when that day had come, there will be nothing that will cause a hindrance or be in their way to receive the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit is to come. And in that, also in that time frame of Jesus' ascension, between the ascension and Pentecost, there were 10 days that were in between to equal up to the whole 50 days. 40 days plus 10 is 50. Um, I looked up the number 10. The number 10 in Hebrew means divine order or a complete cycle, which brings back to what I said in the earlier statement that the triunity had to be complete. You said 10 meant what? 10, the number 10 in Hebrew means divine order 
or a completed cycle. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, so in this 10 days, they were praying and they also gathered people to be in the same room to do what Jesus told them to do and to wait until that day came. They didn't know when the day was going to come. They just knew that they had, to, had, they had an assignment to go back to the same room and to prepare the space for the Holy Spirit to come. And I wanted to do that before I got to Acts 2 because I wanted to give a little bit more of what the upper room was and what happened before. So now I'm going to go to Acts 2. And I'm going to start at the first verse. And it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place and suddenly a sound from heaven like a rushing violent wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared to them tongues resembling fire, which were distribute, distributed among them, and they rested on each other as each person received the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled, that is, diffused throughout their being with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, different languages, as the Holy Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out clearly and appropriately. So as I read these scriptures, in these scriptures, it explains the Holy Spirit was coming to introduce himself. But he can only come if everyone was on the same wavelength, if everyone was on the same page and one accord for the Holy Spirit to come and to fill those who were open and receptive to be filled by the Holy Spirit. And while they were in the upper room, they were positioned, they were sitting. So they were in a place where they were ready to receive what was about to happen. So when the Holy Spirit came, there was a sound that he made to make his presence be made known to those who gathered. And other than the sound, we also read that there was a violent wind that filled the place. That same wind that filled the place was the wind that God was giving his breath for new life. When receiving the Holy Spirit, your life has now become new. You become a new person. So the old that you were before you received the Holy Spirit is not the person that God has chosen you to be. So when receiving the Holy Spirit, like I said, your life has become new. And now you have been sealed by salvation. When you, when you accept the Holy Spirit, that has now become your seal for you giving your life and accepting the spirit of truth into your life. So in that, you don't have to be a perfect individual you don't have to be perfect, but you just have to be open and receptive to what God is trying to put into you. God wants an open vessel to put his spirit into. God wants to use us as those who he has created to put his spirit back into so that we can do the things that he has called us to do. <laughs> Lastly, the people, it, going down in Acts, the people who were outside of the upper room heard the same sound that was going on the inside, but when they heard the sound, they were confused. They didn't know what was going on. All they know, they just heard sound, and they heard tongues of different languages, and they asked them, are these these same people that we know, in paraphrasing, and they joked about it. They thought that they were drunk of wine. But when I read that again, the, the term that most of us use when we say that we're drunk in the spirit, this is where this actually makes sense, to be drunk in the spirit. Because when you're drunk in the spirit, that means that the Holy Spirit has now taken over you because you have now tapped into a place 
to where the other people may look at you, they may think that you're drunk. But to carnal eyes and carnal minds, they don't see or they can't feel what we're feeling or what, we're, we, what we are experiencing in that moment with us being gathered together, being on the same wavelength. So when the Holy Spirit came and filled those who were in the upper room, the Holy Spirit opened up a language that can only be expressed through the Holy Spirit. Because if I speak in tongues and you speak in tongues, some may not, we may not understand each other, but the Holy Spirit has perfect understanding of what we're trying to communicate to him. And lastly, this is lastly, lastly. Um, when, when we make a sound, some of us make a sound and sometimes that sound may not be the right sound. And this part where it came to me is that just because we have a voice doesn't mean that we have the right sound. If we have the correct sound, that's where things will unlock and things will happen suddenly for us because we have now become on the same wavelength and we're all together and the Holy Spirit can move as he please because we're in the same room at the same time giving the same thing at the same time to get the access of the opening of the Holy Spirit. I hope that was, hope that wasn't confusing. <laughs> but <laughs> as we come upon Pentecost, this is where I'm like ending. As we come upon Pentecost, even though we're not physically in a quote unquote upper room, but if we're on the same wavelength and we are connected, the Holy Spirit will come to refresh and refill us just by sending the wind of God, which is the breath of God to give us a new life a new whatever that we need is new that's where when we give our life and accept the holy spirit is where things that we want to be free from will be broken off of us just by accepting the holy spirit and having that seal that our life is well we have eternal life rather in him because we gave our life back to christ and that's where i'm done any questions before I open up a can of worms? <laughs> Any questions or um, comments or add-ons? You two did a wonderful job. Um, let me see. Can we talk a little bit more about the, you said something that um, really opened something up to me because um, I don't think many people identify that the upper room is the same room that Jesus uh, took his disciples in to have the last Passover. And I'm sure many of you, um, many of us who are on this uh, teaching um, forum, um, did not uh, did not know that aspect that it was the same room um, that there was no difference um, so that was good that you brought that out which denotes to us that the um, upper room was not a big room but it was a small room um, and biblical history says that there were 120 people in that small room plus there were 120 men in that room, plus women and children who they did not give a number of how many women and children were in that room. So they're all bunched up in a small space and they're waiting for something. Um, it is of my persuasion that they did not know what they were waiting for. Um, because when Jesus ascended, um, he didn't say that he was sending the Holy Spirit. Um, when Jesus ascended, um, he just told them in verse in chapter one, verse four, um, it says, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the father, which saith ye have heard of me for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy ghost, not many days hence. 
which says to me that they did not necessarily understand what was getting ready to take place, but they were out of obedience to the command of what Jesus told them was number one, do not leave Jerusalem. And if it was us, half of us would have left. That's my first uh, point. Uh, <laughs> um, you said that it did not happen 10 days because remember, Jesus walked the earth for 40 days because people have been trying to get where we get 50 days for Pente till Pentecost, but you broke that down yeah, because Jesus walked on the earth for 40 days where he showed his actual hands. Ma, you know what I'm talking about because you're shaking your head in agreement with me. I must be doing something good today <laughs> in agreement with you, Pastor. But he walked for 40 days to show the nails in his hands and the nails in his feet. Um, and then for 10 days, they waited in prayer. They did not just wait there, but they waited seeking God and in supplication, waiting for the promise or the manifestation of Holy Spirit or the promise. So for 10 days, they were in this small room waiting for what God, waiting for what Jesus had promised them. Now, if the truth be told, most of us would not be able to last with each other for two day, for one day. Listen here, you talking good, sir. But they waited 10 days, and guess what? Their mindset wasn't on anybody else, but their mindset was they wanted what God promised them. And I, and I believe this is where the church lacks um, the ability to really receive an impartation from God because they waited in an upper room, in a small room. I'm sure they were hot and they were sweating out of their clothes, but, they, but God made them a promise. And because God made them a promise, not just for one person to receive, but for the whole room to receive, they, there was no get away from me or don't touch me or, or I don't like you. It was, I don't even care if I like you or not. I'm not here to like you. I'm here because there was a promise that God has made to me. And until I get that promise, I'm not leaving. And no matter how long it takes for me to get it, I'm going to wait here. Whether it takes one day, three days, five days, or 10 days, I'm going to wait here until I receive what I have to receive. And because they were on one accord, there was a manifestation of what Jesus promised them. And the Bible did not say only one person received this promise, but everybody in the upper room received what, God, what Jesus promised them. My God, I feel like preaching, Lord. But that, but, but that was, that was um, very good, all right? Now, another point that you made that I wrote down was, you don't have to be perfect to receive it, which kills the theology that you have to be, that, that, you, that you have to be clean to receive the gifting of the Holy Spirit. Hello, church. Because my, my, my. Because it, it kills He's talking, the whole, sir. It heals the it kills the whole denotation that I have to be right in order to receive his gift. Because guess what? The Holy Spirit comes to do one thing, and that is to regenerate us. Regenerate. He comes to when he when he fills us, everything about us begins to change. Preach apostle. Who's that MJ with the clapping of the hand? Marcine. Oh. <laughs> Any questions? Anybody want to elaborate on that? Because I grew up saying, uh, saying the reason why he ain't feel me was because there was still something in me that God couldn't get in because it was blocking him from getting to me. That was the doctrine that I came up under, that the reason why I wasn't feel because there was something blocking him from filling me. When the purpose of him filling me was so that he can live in me. And when he lives in me, guess what happens? He sanctifies me and he regenerates me. He begins to change things about me because his character is what dwells in me. 
and nothing outside of his character can remain if he's living in me. You talked about a wavelength and a sound um, and that, that like kind of, um, kind of got to me because we've been talking about frequency in the spirit for a long time. And that's, that's all you were saying um, when you were talking about they were on the same wavelength. Their oneness produced something that got an answer from heaven. Can y'all not wait until the day we all just come in with no expectation, but to get an answer from God? Yep. That we're, we're not worrying about what, what happened yesterday, but we're coming with one mindset that this is what we expect from God and it produces a frequency in heaven that causes God to activate immediately and quickly for not only one person, but his people. And I believe that this is the season that God wants to do that, not just with our local assembly, but with, but with the body altogether. We have been distracted. There is, a, there is so many distractions going on. The, the, I'm, I'm, I'm not even gonna get into this political stuff or into this, uh, this how the black male is, 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 the, is the endangered species in, the, in America. And, and all of that, but there comes a point where when we, when we need God to move swiftly and when we need him to shift on our behalf, there is a oneness that he waits to come from his bride because that's what we are. Believe it or not, we're his bride. We're, we're his bride. That's what, what, he, what he's coming back for is somebody that belongs to him anyway. And his bride is beautiful. Have you ever seen a bride? Well, that be that. that um, Y'all know me. I could just bring something. But have you ever seen at a wedding when a bride, the woman can be the most ugliest thing all year? Say that, sir. Come on here. <laughs> <laughs> the woman can be the most ugliest thing all year. Ooh. I'm sorry. Y'all know I'm a realist. But she can be the most okay. ugliest thing all year. But that wedding day, and one day she's pretty, my God. That God. wedding day, there is something totally different about the look of that woman. Ah. Her makeup doesn't even look the same way because she got a professional to do her face. She didn't even try to do her face herself, but she had a professional makeup artist to do her face. When she used to do her hair, she got a beautician to do her hair. The dress she done paid thousands of dollars for so that she can look beautiful on that day. That one day. That one day. And what we don't understand is there should never be a day where, where Christ's bride looks any kind of way. We are beautiful in the sight of God. And when he comes back, he's coming back for his bride, which is why there is a requirement for us to be one, not divided, but one. I'm going to open up the floor. Kavita, you got a comment? No. <laughs> um, Anybody else? Hey, praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, what stood out to me and what you just said, Bishop, was that uh, she paid for her dress and she paid for a professional. To be the bride, it's going to cost you. Hello. If you look that good, it's going to cost you. And it's going to cost you dearly. And so without sacrifice, <laughs> we, we can't have that sacred union. My God. So That's even... Good on the night what the reason why it is said we must wait to involve us as an intercourse is for the marriage night is because the the husband man has to enter into the bride and he breaks her hymen and so there's the shedding of blood right there that's a sacrifice because that's going to be painful your first time you've never had sex before it's going to hurt and you're going to shed blood as a female and so that's the imagery of that sacrifice so if He's looking for his bride, and he wants one without spot or wrinkle. That's what the scripture says. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to point that out. Good stuff, Bishop. Yes, sir. That's really good. It costs something to be the bride. I'm going to have to preach that. That might be something I say on Sunday. But it costs something to be the bride. Any other comments? Come on, I want to hear from our leaders tonight. 
about Pentecost? I, I do have a question. I thought about something. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so I just thought about it. When you say the Holy Ghost can, um, you can get the Holy Ghost, but you don't, what was it you said? You don't have, not perfect, but it's something else, another word you use. You clean. Don't have to be clean. Okay, I yeah, you don't have to be clean. Bro. But what's the scripture that says the Holy Ghost don't dwell in an unclean temple? That's what that has to do with. Okay. I don't know. Somebody that's already saved. Okay. I just want clarification. The born again believer. Okay. Got it. That's all. One clarification I wanted to give on the day of on the on Pentecost because uh I think that, that we've become misconstrued on the um the whole celebration of the birthing of the church. But what we don't quite understand is that the spirit of God was given to us to be a witness. When the day of Pentecost came and they received the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, and they began to speak with other tongues as the spirit of God gave them utterance. During that time, there were many different nationalities that were surrounding them. And the people began to be amazed because they began to understand what they were saying in their own native language. Meaning that, that as they were praising God and as they were giving God glory for what was happening to them in their flesh, because the Holy Spirit penetrated their flesh. So what literally took place is now there began to be an understanding of what has been going on and all of this time of not having clarity on what they were talking about during the during with the Jesus's time now there became a clarity of who they are and many were saved because now they began to understand their native language so my question to you is when you are filled with the holy ghost who are you whose soul are you winning How many of us can testify that we have won souls to Christ because we have been filled with the Holy Ghost, which makes us witnesses to men? Because the celebration of this was not necessarily the tongues, which is why, uh, which is why he had to say, we're not drunk as you suppose. Because what they did was, that because there was such an infilling of of God that it looked like they were drunk and he had to bring clarity to them and say, no, we're not drunk as you suppose, but what is taking place is that prophecy is now being manifested. And what, what's happening is revival has now broken out, my God, and revival has not only broken out in this area, but revival has now broken out all over the world because now there is an understanding of what's coming through not just one person, but through all nationalities. So the sole purpose of being filled with the Holy Ghost is not necessarily to speak with other tongues, but to be witnesses. Acts 1 and verses, let me put my glasses on. 7 and 8 says, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that. And power here means dunamis. Dunamis means demonstration. So what he's saying is what I'm getting ready to do is I'm giving, getting ready to give you the ability to produce. So he said, but ye shall receive the ability to produce after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, which means where you are currently, and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. In other words, what I'm endowing you with is the ability to win the, to win the lost. The reason why I'm giving you my spirit is because you have to take what is, what is in me and, and share it with the world and win them over. And not only will you win them over with word, but I'm getting ready to give you the ability to win them over. And with the ability comes the giftings that I already have in you. 
which says to me that the giftings are not just for the church, but they're for the world. The world has to see the giftings in order to be saved. So the whole celebration of Pentecost has to deal with God giving us the ability to win the lost, which gives us a mandate that our jobs as Holy Ghost filled people is to win the lost. There should be somebody in our life that does not know Christ. Hallelujah. That's being one. I have a testimony and then I'm going to open the floor for about uh, 10 minutes because uh, we got 20 minutes. But I have a testimony. One of my employees, Franklin, came to church the Sunday after my birthday. Um, and when he, I'm not, I'm, some of you may have re remember when he was there. Um, and I think overseer, I sent overseer to minister to him. Well, from that day, he has been extremely inquisitive about not necessarily church because I, I'm not churched. When, when, I, when I deal with in the ministry aspect, I don't force church on anybody because church will come once they get a desire to know Jesus. So in our conversation, he's been very inquisitive and I've been noticing that he asks me questions and the things that I tell him to do, he does. Like I'll say, you shouldn't do this, but this is how you should do. You, you should seek a better education in this area. And then the next day he'll come back to me and says, Thomas, this is what I did, X, Y, Z. Like he follows, this is why it pays to be filled with the spirit and it pays to obey God because those, those who, are, who are coming into the knowledge of Christ will build a trust for you and they will, they will start obeying what you say because they trust the God that's in you. So about two days, last week we had a conversation and I mentioned something about not being able to sleep. And I'm not sure if I was talking to the school of the um, prophets registrants about this that day, or I was having a conversation with the leaders, but I was having a conversation with somebody about not being able to sleep and being awake. And I happened to speak out loud about it. And he stood up and said that he was not able to sleep. And he said, well, Thomas, why am I not able to sleep? And I said, because the Lord, and this, this is me, y'all know how I am. I said, because God is trying to tell you something. So he was looking at me really strange as if to say, God ain't trying to tell me anything. And I said, no, you're not sleeping because God is trying to warn you or he's trying to give you instructions. Well, the next day he came and came to, to work and you could tell when somebody has fear over their face. So when he got there, he looked extremely fearful as if something was wrong. And he said, Thomas, I got to tell you something. And I said, what? And he said, you were right. And I said, right about what? He said, that was a warning. He said, I had to, something that I was contemplating doing, I had to not do. And I said, okay. And I, I said, can you tell me what it was? He said, he was selling cocaine, y'all. Hear this, hear this testimony. He was selling cocaine. At 3 a.m. in the morning, the Holy Spirit convicted him about selling that cocaine. And he threw the cocaine in the trash. Y'all don't hear, hear me today. My mom. Yeah. He threw the cocaine in the trash. And I said to him, I said, Franklin, don't go back to selling that cocaine. Don't go back to doing that. I said, because that was a warning. And if you try to do it again, you're going to get in trouble. And he said, oh, I know, I know. I'm not going to do that anymore. And a man has vowed to be in church. Now, mind you, I've never even mentioned bringing his butt to church. But he has vowed to be in church because this is what he says. He wants the connection with God that I have. My Lord. Well, come it's on. It's about here, being a witness. Right. <clears throat> it's, it's not about forcing religion on people. 
It's about being a witness. And when you're a witness, you'll win them to Christ. So that's my testimony during Pentecost. Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to open the floor. Any other questions? So our celebration of Pentecost is not necessarily our celebration because we speak in tongues. But our celebration of Pentecost is because God is literally making us witnesses in the earth. And I believe that this pandemic, amen, is getting ready to really cause us to rise. And I'm not ju just talking about us as a local assembly, but the church. I've never seen so many churches with outdoor services. I've never seen so many churches with that, that, that are really taking the initiative and assisting the communities when the church was built for the purpose of making sure the communities were taken care of. So God is reviving his bride and he's causing his bride to be seen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we thank God for our teachers tonight. You all did a wonderful job tonight. Hand thank claps. you, sir. Claps. Amen. You all did a wonderful job. Amen. Let's give tonight. Amen. Wherever you are, let's give. Let's give a $20 seed. Amen. You all know the giving outlets. If not, a prayer can put them on the screen. Um, but um, give our giving outlets. Let's give a seed of twenty dollars. Listen. Um, oh, let me unpin him so that I'm just excited. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Give C C O P I or PayPal Citadella Prayer I N T. Amen. Follow me with twenty dollars tonight. Listen, you guys. I am excited about. This road to Pentecost, um, we have one more class on the Holy Spirit, and that is next Tuesday. And then after that, we're going to start a series um, dealing with um, dealing with um, evangelism. Um, so we're praying about uh, our next sermon title, but, but we're going to focus on the Great Commission. <clears throat> our next series is going to focus on the Great Commission. And we're going to deal with the great, um, with witnessing, not only in the church, but in the marketplace, um, learning how to witness in the business arena, um, learning how to witness in all entities. So we're going to have some guests as well that are going to come on and um, pour into the, to us in that area. But I believe our job in this season, this is the time <clears throat> the evangelists are up next. So this is the time where the evangelists are really getting ready to show themselves. Um, in the nation. And what we've been calling um, prophets are really evangelists and they're getting ready to really rise. Um, so um, I am excited about this next season or phase that God is putting the, the ministry um, or his church in. Um, <clears throat> by way of announcements, Jeremiah is preaching on two Tuesdays from today. Um, so we will be in-house um, two Tuesdays um, on today. Um, and I'll talk to the people that I want there on, um, on that Tuesday. Um, we are outside for our drive-up service on this Sunday. Um, so everybody um, can come out um, and you can worship in your cars um, or on or we will put some chairs out or some chairs. Um, we have mad, I have about 150 masks. Uh, we have gloves. Uh, we have hand sanitizer that we're going to distribute. Um, we have cleaning products that we're going to distribute. We'll be on the grill giving out food um, to everybody that drives up and down the road. And of course, to you all. Um, we're just going to have a Pentecost time and Acts 15 experience when they were out in the street and God and the spirit of the Lord started healing them out in the street. I'm believing God for that experience on Sunday. Um, what else? Elder Donaldson, anything? School of the Prophets is next Wednesday. 
So if you have not registered, please make sure you register. I look horrible. School of the Prophets is on um, next Wednesday. Um, so please make sure that you register. Those of you prophetic voices in our house, make sure that you register. We know that it's a requirement. Amen. So make sure that you register. Um, anything else? Jared's school ministering. Right, but we'll deal with that in two weeks from now. Okay. Um, there was one more thing and I forgot. Oh, yes, I can, a prayer. Let me, oh, never mind. Too late now. I just got your message. I'm sorry. Um, Tithers, if you're tithing tonight, make sure that you um, you uh, put that it's, that it's your tithe. The funny thing is our ministry is growing in the pandemic. God is sustaining us in the pandemic, and I am excited. Um, I, am, I am thoroughly excited about what God is doing. Um, I am really, really, really excited. You guys are taking up the burden of prayer at 6 a.m., and 6 p.m. and I am excited about that. And assessors, I hear you on the call. I hear those who have not, who are afraid of praying, taking up the mantle of prayer and pushing through. I, I, I hear and feel the fire on the altar of prayer and it really, really, really excites me because y'all know that is my vein. And if we don't do anything else and we're on the calls praying, it really gives me life. Um, so jumping on the calls, hearing those who have never prayed before, um, praying really excites me. Jeremiah is um, on the line praying. Ricks is on the line praying. Um, some others who haven't really been praying are on the line praying. And many of you all are getting ready to take up the burden and pray too. So um, hats off to uh, to our um, chief intercessor, um, uh, who is really expanding um, the intercessory, intercessory team and stretching their capacity, um, which is awesome. Um, we are getting ready to start leadership calls once a month. Amen. But this forum, I really like this forum. Um, so this will work for us. Um, I'm believing God um, for a building by the end of this pandemic. Um, as, the Lord, as the Lord already spoke to us, things are dropping and we are getting ready to walk in homes and things like that. So I'm believing God for those things. Um, I want to thank Marcine, amen, who is our North Carolina member. She'll be preaching soon too. But I want to thank her because Yay! all we did was send her money and she got the job done for us. Um, she got the job done for us and everything we need as far as um, uh, essentials that we cannot find here. She went out and put wigs and stuff on to get the stuff. Amen. So we, so we, thank, Amen for the way. <laughs> so we thank God for her. Um, if you have volunteered to bring food, please make sure that you bring what you say you're going to bring. We don't need any balls dropped. Amen. We have um, we have partnered with several pantries that are happening that are helping, amen. And I, today uh, we partnered with another pantry that's going that's assisting us. So um, things are looking good as far as groceries and stuff. Jermaine, amen. They're looking good. <laughs> Jermaine, Jermaine was somewhere. I'm not even going to tell this testimony, but um, uh, um, we're looking good as far as that area. Um, I want to make sure that we just hand out plates to people that are driving down the road um, so they'll know that we're cooking, um, that we're grilling. Amen. Um, there was one other thing, and it slipped my mind. Um, I see you guys giving. Thank you. I hear, I hear, I hear it on my uh, iPad, so I appreciate you giving. Um, what else? Um, there was one other thing. Those of you who donated monetarily, thank you. I want to get this all out of the way now. 
But there was one other thing I had to say, and it's almost 9.30. What did I miss? Elder Donaldson and I, am I missing something? Elder Burgess, am I missing something? Um, July? No, we're not on July yet. Oh, uh, the intercessors. Um, there is a guest that's going to be uh, on the line um, with you all on the 8th of June um, at 6 p.m. So make sure that you guys are on there um, to uh, hear the ministry of this woman of God as she pour into our prayer team um, and all of that. And Amen. also this Friday. And also this week, Bishop, also this week, this Friday, we have another um, guest that's coming. This Friday at 6, we have another guest. Yeah. So make sure that you guys are on the call um, as she prays and pours into you. Amen. Um, I think that's it. Ma, you want to say something or you waving? Oh, my mother's in her home. In her new home. Amen. And she has her own place now. And I don't think my mother has had her own place since I was younger. Amen. So God is good. That's a sign that God is doing something, Kavita. That's a sign. Have a seat. Right Amen. Jermaine, that's a sign right there that God is doing something. Um, so, yeah. All right, we're getting ready to pray. Who do I want to pray? Let's see. Mother Wood. Oh, did I lose her? No, I'm. Mother Wood's on. There you go. You unmuted. Hey, Mother, can you close us out in prayer tonight, please? Yes, sir, I can. Thank you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, just want to thank you for life and that more abundantly. want to thank for the gathering for the, want to thank you, Lord, for the gathering on tonight, God. want to thank you for the teachers on tonight, God. God, we want to thank you, God, that we're going up and over, not down and under, God. We want to thank you, God, that even though there's so much going on in the world tonight, God, you're keeping us. We thank you and praise you, God, that you're covering us in your blood, God. We thank you and praise you, God, for your love, for your peace, your joy, your happiness, and your understanding, God. You understand us better than we understand ourselves, God. And we're so grateful for it, God. We love you, God. We love you, we love you, we love you, we love you, God. Mm, hallelujah, Jesus. And we thank you for all things. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Oh, before we hang up, please, I need the deacons and everybody else who can get to the church early to help us set up. Amen. I know the musicians are going Saturday night to move things closer to the door and to make sure that everything is uh, able to just move out at one time. So please, I think, what time did we say we were going to be there? Nine. All right, amen. So deacons, I need you there at nine. All right. Love y'all. God bless. <laughs>